Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of the Social Liability Podcast, the only podcast where two middle-aged men sit around and decry the people that violate the social contract we all agree to live by. I'm your host, the Razgrees, with my co-host, the Buck Grundle. And in this week's episode, we're going to talk about the most dreaded of all things, insurance. Oh, my God, I hate insurance in every way possible. Yay! And Buck, on the other hand, was an insurance salesman, so let's hate on Buck together. Go, uh, bring all the hate you got, brother. So, uh, people in general hate insurance salesmen. In general, everyone does, and everyone hates dealing with insurance companies, whether that be home, life, what have you. Uh, why do you think that is, Buck? I honestly can't tell you because I worked in insurance, and even other insurance men don't, or insurance people, excuse me, don't like other insurance agents. They just don't. Well, so, like, literally nobody likes them. I, I can't explain why that paradox exists. Well, I'm going to tell you, and uh, this is not a disparaging uh, comment towards you, but this is a reality, and you can, I, I, I challenge you to call me a liar on this. Most people that sell insurance didn't even know what job they were applying for. They go into those interviews, quote-unquote, as a business opportunity where they can make their own hours, unlimited income, so you got the people that are, <laughs> quite frankly, they probably just lost a job somewhere and they're pretty desperate and they get contacted by somebody on LinkedIn or on some freaking Craigslist ad or something and tells them, I got this great business opportunity, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they show up there and, <laughs> well, you can come work for us selling insurance. And it's almost like, it almost sounds like a bloody pyramid scheme when they first start where, because you, you know, if you, you have to pay this much up front for your training, but then we're going to do this for you. And then we're going to, you know, give you an office and <laughs> print your business cards for you. Am I, am I making any of this up, Buck? Uh, that's why I haven't interrupted you. You pretty much told the story of my career after the prison. Yeah. So how did you get started, you know, in the, one of the most evil professions in creation? I got diagnosed with MS, had to leave my job at the prison, and uh, I was willing to do any. Like, my sleeves were rolled up, and I was willing to go to work doing anything. I would even flip burgers if they would have me. So, um, there were a lot of companies that were fly by night organizations and, you know, did exactly what you were saying. You know, you put up all this seed money and get your own training and this and that and the other thing, and then we'll pay you. And,. I'm very glad that my ex-wife would not allow me to pony up money to work. Yeah, the whole concept of uh, we're going to, you know, you, you pay this much up front and we're going to help you. No, screw you. I'm not paying you for the privilege of working for you. And that, that was the same thing like when we were talking about buying and selling cars. Uh, at the end of that Automax thing, the reason I, as I said, on the, on the last day, I didn't come back. Uh, and I went to work for the Department of Corrections. The one of the main reasons was on that fifth, on the four, end of the fourth day, uh, they told you you had to bring a check to pay for the Automax class so that you could reimburse your employer for all the money they put into you. And I told them to uh, eat me. I'm not paying you for the privilege of working for you. And, you know, it, it boils down to the fact I want to touch base on this because you mentioned it earlier. I was freaking desperate. I was at the point where. I would have done anything to just have a job up to and including pay somebody to work. Like I am the kind of sucker that gets railed into those schemes hook line and think. Well, you I know? do have this bridge that uh, you might be interested in. Right. Exactly, and I'd probably buy a timeshare there. <laughs> oh god. But the the whole concept of what, the way they reel people in, they they're already showing you that their 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 industry is made up of douche canoes right out the gate but they're also preying on people and you know there are some people that do it and are very successful you were for the limited time you were there you were very successful at it at least in my opinion you were but i, I did okay but you have people in there they they're they, they they've got to make money just on people coming in paying for training and then 
realizing they're never they're not going to cut it and going and flipping burgers. And and I won't say that for the company I worked for, because the, you know they're they're still going strong today. But there are other companies that that yeah they they make their money just off of just off of the people they prey on. Yeah, and that that's a, that doesn't just go for insurance. If you ever walk into an interview and they tell you there's an upfront cost, walk the fuck away. It is a scam. Absolutely. And then and and I'll tell you what, another good point is make sure that you discuss this crap with your friends and with your peers. Ultimately, you know, people's opinions are going to be what they are. But you can assimilate all that information and and make a good decision for yourself and your family if that's if that's what you're you know striving to do, because I'll tell you if it wasn't for you and our constable friend, I mean I would have walked I would have walked into one of those things hook line and sinker, you know combined with that and my ex-wife being like ah eh, no, because <laughs> yeah but it, but but it got to the point where I was desperate where I was actually having those discussions with uh with uh ex Mrs. Lynch and um and and it just it's all about desperation. Well and, desperation on two fronts. Not only is it desperation for the people they're trying to get to work there, but then they're teaching them to prey on the desperate and prey on the people that are just too correct. stupid to know any better. Absolutely. So, what what are some of the things they they teach you to, in order to uh, to prey upon the vulnerable of society? I never, I never, I never got you, on any of those. See, I know you didn't do it. I know exactly the kind of people you took. You took the clients nobody else wanted to take, and you actually did something with it. But what are the more despicable things that you've seen? Oh, oh, okay. Well, I mean, you know, this is this applies to life insurance, but. A lot of times I would see other advisors prey off of a large cash value in a life insurance policy and try to flip it into a commissionable product. And that that was that that always just quite frankly just pissed me off when I'd see that. Um you know, uh that that would probably be the biggest one. Uh teaching t- and teaching sales advisors like sales managers teaching their sales advisors on how to pitch this and make it sound like a good idea when it is not. So, you know, that that was a very bad practice in my book when they would take a, uh, a, a completely healthy policy and try to flip that cash value into a commissionable sale so they could line their pockets, even though it wasn't the right thing to do for their client. You know, I've walked away from, I've walked away from million dollar, excuse me, million dollar policies but probably tens and and thousands of dollars of commission just because I wasn't willing to do that. Yeah, you you seem like you put in an inordinate amount of time to some cases that you barely got anything out of just because you were being too damn nice. Now, if you were the, the unscrupulous, like we have probably many of in the office you worked out of, um, <laughs> they probably would have made bank. Probably. Probably. Uh, my my biggest problem was that I would look at somebody and make them a promise. And especially in the very beginning, I wouldn't realize how difficult that promise would be to keep. And I definitely ran into a, a big situation where, yeah, I would have to do and spend an inordinate... I'd have to spend more money to travel to and from the house to deliver and do all the paperwork for a policy than I would get in commission for actually doing the work because because I would make promises and keep them. But ultimately, that benefited me because, you know, my clients, you know, my really good clients would always say, you know, go to Mark. He's a stand-up guy. He'll drive to your house at 2 in the morning for a kid's life insurance policy because, well, damn it, if I made you a promise or I made you a commitment, I kept it. And um, I, I think that's a uh, – I think that is – probably one of the uh, one of the biggest qualities that is dying out in in the workforce especially in that insurance and sales industry is just a little personal integrity because it goes a lot farther than you than than you would think anytime you're de- I, I find this as a rule of thumb anytime you're dealing with anybody who is commission based 
you can't believe a word that comes out of their mouth. Now, I'm not saying there's not honest people out there. You were one of them. I'm not saying they don't exist. But you've got a hell of an uphill battle to get win over on me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That that definitely makes it a lot harder. That but, made it a lot harder. It, it really was. Now, I still have that policy, by the way. But I absolutely... Every time one of those little douche nozzles tries to call me to... We just want to go over your stuff with you. I don't even return their calls. I tell them to kiss my ass. I'm not talking to you. You touch my policy, and I'll, I'll close it immediately. Uh, I want nothing to do with any of them. I don't want them getting a dime off of me. You know? <laughs> Mostly because it was a crooked-ass company. And two, um, the only reason I did it was because uh, you worked there. <laughs> and I still am eternally grateful for, for that. I really, really am. You you definitely helped me through a rough stint in my in the very beginning of my career. Well, there was a there was a handful of people that jumped in on that, so don't don't try to blow too much sunshine up my ass on that one. But well, if they ever got on this podcast, believe me, I'd give them personal accolades too. But since they're not, you get to hog them all, be a thunder thief, and just say, accept the thank you. Yeah. And I did get it get you know a lot of enjoyment about screwing with your boss. Oh, that was great. That was. I, good. I, t- I told him I didn't want him at my house. <laughs> but I mean, like you know, that's that's all sales stuff, though, and and you know, it it really isn't like the meat and potatoes. I mean, like, there's so many different types of insurance. All I did was life, accident, health. I did some annuities, and then the most of it, most of the other stuff that I did was financial advisory stuff. So, you know, the only the only applicable life experience I have would be on the insurance side and um, as entertaining as some of that stuff was I think we can find something a little bit more uh, substantial <laughs> to, uh, to inform the masses upon like uh, like auto insurance for instance like tell me, tell me go ahead and give me your thoughts on that one Raz <laughs> uh, well auto insurance like any kind of insurance is hyperinflated in reality, you're not, you're paying way much more than you ever should, and the reason behind that is, uh, let's just let, let me let, let, I, let me speak to the one I can speak the most about. So I spent ten years working as a private investigator, part time, full time, just depended on what year it was, and I, I did a lot of what I called fidelity insurance, and that was I think my husband's cheating on me. Here's a news flash, folks, and this is for a whole nother episode. When we talk about that. If you think they are. They are. Save your yep. money. But Pretty much. the bread and butter of the industry was insurance. We, the, the, my biggest, my bread and freaking butter was workers' compensation claims. And it, it, workers' comp claims and auto insurance claims, they go hand in hand. And they, we, <laughs> that is the, the, the biggest thing that people get mad about is my car insurance costs this much. This is outrageous. It's not outrageous because of the insurance company. It's not outrageous because of you. It's outrageous because of your neighbor. Nine out of every ten workers' compensation, disability, and uh, auto insurance claims is fraudulent. Nine out of every ten. Now, the thing about that is they don't start out that way. For the most part, most claims start out as perfectly genuine. You have somebody gets hurt at work, and they legitimately get hurt at work. And the next thing you know, they're they're they go out on workers' comp. They're getting paid to sit at home on their tuchus and go to a doctor's appointment every couple of weeks, so the doctor can say, "Are you still feeling any kind of pain?" Well, yeah. Well, you can't go back to work, and they sign the little little mm-hmm. form there, and you get real used to that real quick. You do. <laughs> if you get paid to sit at home. And do whatever it is you do, whether that's, you know, watch football, uh, play with your dog, go on Pornhub, what have you. Whatever your hobby might be, getting paid to sit home and do it, that is kind of the dream, man. So people get really Yeah, buddy, welcome to retirement. That's what retirement's all about, buddy. Uh They get real addicted to that real quick. So the claim may not start out as fraudulent, but nine nine out of every ten claims end that way and it's it's utterly ridiculous I mean I I don't have any experience in that sector but I'll tell you what I sat in enough cars with you to uh, to know that 
you know what? It's just a lot of waiting just to find out that somebody's full of shit. Oh, it's not even just waiting to find out. It's just waiting to prove it. That's the way it is. I went into every single case with the mindset of, I have to catch this person. Because that that was the thing. I, there was, I mean, in my entire career of doing insurance fraud investigations, there was one case, one case, I know definitively, this was 100% positive 100 percent righteous claim all the other ones i i couldn't tell you for sure there's maybe one or two of them but i had so many so many gotcha moments and <laughs> there here's a little secret in in most states uh when you video somebody which you need video evidence record uh you can't you can record anything you want video wise as long as you are recording from a place you have a legal right to be you cannot, however, in most states, record audio. Ah. So, like, in uh, in some states, you have what's called a one-party consent state. So as long as one person that's on the, the film or, or the recording knows they're being recorded, you're fine. Like, that's New York State. New York State, for example, you can, as long as you know you're being recorded, you're fine. And you can record anybody else doing anything you want. Uh, this is not illegal. I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving legal advice. Just saying that in my personal experience, that's the way I believe it to be, even though I've testified in court to such. Anyhow. Right. There's other states where it's a two-party consent state where everybody involved has to be aware of the recording. So for the most part, uh, insurance companies will require you to re submit video that has no audio to it at all, which is fine. But I, I challenge you to find a camcorder on the market that has the ability to turn off the audio. Oh, uh, yeah. You're not going to. So most of your 99%, 99.9% of all footage out there exists with the audio and then has it rendered out <laughs> before it's sent to the, uh, the claimant. Or to the, uh, yeah, the claimant. The, uh, the client. So in a, there is so much of my footage... If you were to go back and look at the raw footage, which has all since been destroyed, unfortunately, you would hear me yelling, I got your ass! I got your ass! <laughs> because it was... I, well, I mean, you it, gotta celebrate whatever victory you can. It was, it was a moment of celebration when you get these these little jackasses because you knew that... you. I, I honestly felt like a goddamn hero catching these people because the more people that get caught the less my insurance rate's going to be. Truth. Truth, truth. Now, I you challenge know. every single person that's listening, and I'm, I'm going to ask you specifically. I challenge anybody to t tell me with a straight face, look me in the eye and say, I don't know anyone who's ever cheated an insurance company. Well, hey, it's all about mitigating risk, okay? And that's, that's what an insurance company does. They mitigate risk. And their products... Are commensurate with the amount of risk that they undertake to insure the masses so you are correct if you reduce the amount of people cheating the system then the risk of that happening goes down and then the calculation or whatever matrix they use to get to our premium numbers is uh, is going to reflect those those numbers as well you know people people need to understand that you can't teach a computer to cheat okay in order for that in order to matriculate that information and and cheat it i mean like you would have to fudge all sorts of numbers in all sorts of places you just would you know that information is ironclad when they when they put it into those computers it's all an algorithm so you are right you reduce the amount of people cheating the system and the overall amount of risk that the insurance company is mitigating goes down. It's not just the risk of you having an accident or, or filing a claim. It's the risk of you doing something, you know, mischievous, deceitful, chicanerous, or deplorable. And uh, and that's what insurance fraud really boils down to. Yeah, there, there are two vehicle insurance companies that I can guarantee you, 100%, guarantee you, that if you ever have a claim, either they're your carrier or you are involved in some kind of vehicle accident home or whatever where you end up being injured and you file a claim against them i can guarantee you 
for the next for the rest of your life, if you're claiming disability, at least 40 hours a year, someone's watching you. 100%. And here's the thing. Private investigators are not cheap at all. No. I, I know what I charged, and I was on the bottom end of the scale. Right. And I, I still felt like shit charging that much. But I had to, otherwise they'd take me seriously. And besides, if they wanted to give me money, I was going to take it. Well, but, I mean, what's the insurance company for you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, it was worth it to them. Because, you know, they may be you know, spending a couple thousand dollars to have me go out and watch somebody. But one, my, my success rate was pretty damn high. But even if it wasn't, and they were just taking a blind shot in the dark, people only put up the act for so long. And the chances of them slipping up and being caught is pretty significant. Uh, you just have to, you know, have somebody out there that has a little bit of knowledge of what they're doing and they're going to get caught. It's not people, you know, Oh, I'm, I'm never going to get caught. I'm great at this. You know, blah, 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 bullshit. You're, you're going to, you're going to screw it up. Eventually you can't do it your whole life. Cause then it becomes a job and then you're doing, that's basically you're working for that check anyway. Right. Exactly. You can't, you can't keep the hangman. Like that's just it. You cannot live that lie forever. But that I mean that that company in particular, you know, they they're hardcore. They like completely hardcore to the point where, you know, I I worked for a company uh, that under my contract, they could send me up to three hours away from my house. Anything over three hours, they had to pay for a hotel room. And these folks were very good at sending me two hours and 50 minutes away from my house. They were very good at that. Oh, that's a crock of shit. There was one instance, though, in particular, where they sent me about 20 minutes away from my house. Now, you didn't think I was like, whoa, this is amazing. This is great. I am thrilled. And I went and, you know, worked 20 minutes from my house. This is great. And... uh, there's a certain period of time where you, you sit and you wait. And if you don't get, you know, results, you cut bait for the day and go to another case or go home for the day or, or what have you. But we came right up on that time frame, real, real close. And I saw a van pull into the driveway and I'm thinking, okay, cool. We got some movement. I can get, you know, another X amount of hours out of this today. This is great. Well, I'm watching. And it's like, Dude's not getting out of the van. And I noticed the van does have handicapped plates, but in a, you know, as in a previous episode we discussed, those are not hard to get. So that was never a, an indication of anything. Well, finally, I, I, I get eyes on the guy. And when he comes down the driveway in his motorized wheelchair <laughs> to check his mail. Now, if you're not in the medical field or have any kind of experience with these such of things. You may not know these terms, but let's start with atrophy. Hmm. Atrophy is when your muscles are no longer in use. So they shrivel up and go away. Yes, they do. So the yes. point where your legs look like you were somebody being carried out of Auschwitz. I mean, yes, this is, you look horrible. His legs are clearly atrophied. His arms are like all folded up in a state we call contracture. Meaning he doesn't move them very often and the muscles are in a constant state of uh, tautness. This dude is a train wreck. This dude is clearly a quadriplegic. Now he's doing everything he can to take care of himself. He wasn't the one driving the van, by the way. Uh, but he, <laughs> this dude is you can't fake this stuff <laughs> and this is the one case where I was like oh my lord this is a legit claim so I called the client up well actually I called the case manager and said you need to contact the client and tell them this claim is righteous as the day is long and they're wasting their time now uh, another thing about this company that I wasn't thrilled with was they didn't tell me where I was going the next day until about 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night. And they'd be like, okay, you need to be in like, this place three hours from home at 5 a.m. So that sucked. Well, I get home that night, and I'm waiting and waiting to see where, what fresh hell is going to bring me the next day. And sure as hell, they didn't send me back to that address. I spent over 40 hours at that address. That's the crack of shit. 
I could not believe it. I, I, I was digging through the file trying to find the contact name of the person with the insurance company so I could contact them myself and go, did my case manager actually call you? Because this is I mean, if you want to keep sending me to sit here, that's fine. Because I can go home and take a shit. I don't have to worry about where I'm, what gas station I'm going to take a dump in today. But when it is legit, like, why are you wasting your money on this? I feel bad collecting this check. <laughs> this dude is clearly, clearly disabled. Uh, and this is just a waste of time and money. But they, nevertheless, I was there for over a week. Right, and they paid you every cent with a smile on their face thinking that you would prove their way out of having to pay. They did. <laughs> right. And much to their chagrin, they had to pay the claim and the private investigator. Yep, but I guarantee you the very next year they sent somebody else out there. Uh, well, you know what? Snaps to the insurance company. That's that's the money hard at work. And that's that's your that's your premium. So... Buck, do you know of anybody who's in, who's committed insurance fraud? I'm not asking you to throw their name out there, but what ways have you seen insurance fraud in your lifetime? I've seen people go anywhere from faking auto ins- uh, auto accidents to staging a loved one's death to collect to collect an insurance. Claim. And um, I'm not really I'm not really. I can't clearly recollect the details enough to tell the story without it sounding like a bunch of shit. But like the, they they go from that you know from that small, you know just you know faking faking an auto claim all the way up to and as large as faking a loved one's death or their own death. And I've I've seen a lot of those things happen firsthand, and can tell you for a fact that. In the two years that I worked for insurance, probably every amount or every type of insurance fraud you can think of walked into my door some way, shape, or form, whether it be my client or another advisor. Well, I mean, let's 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 take that out of the equation. Let's talk about uh, the uh, people that are claiming disability. Um, we have people that claim disability all the time. Probably people in your social circles. I mean, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, I, I believe somebody who I've done contract work for is the person that was your disability advocate. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I, I was doing work for a disability advocate. That's a mutual friend of ours. And we both know he did a bang up job at what he did. Absolutely. did. That, that practice has since closed. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to make any recommendations, but uh, I was still working in the prison system at the time when I was working for that, you know, person part-time, uh, mostly doing uh, process server stuff, that kind of nonsense. But I had a conversation. I, I might've been with you. I don't even know. Uh, in the prison about, you know, working for somebody who did, it was a disability advocate. And I actually had one of our coworkers. I'm not going to say who it was, but I'm sure you, you, you'll know exactly. Lean over the table. You work for a disability advocate? Uh, yes. How I get me some disability? <laughs> that, that was that, that was the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. How I get me some disability? Just like you know, you go into the store and pick up some disability. <laughs> was this a, a female coworker or a male coworker? That was a female coworker. Okay, I know exactly who it is you were referring to. And we're not going to mention that lady's name. No, I just wanted to, I, I, I pinned it down to two people, and I, and now I, now I am sh- I'm going to send you a text message to see if I got it right. <laughs> well, that person, I, I looked at, I looked her right in the eye and said, "You don't qualify," and walked away. But I have no doubt, no doubt in my mind, without even making a phone call to ask. That woman's probably on disability right now. Uh, check your text messages. No lie. I just sent you who my guest was. <laughs> and you were absolutely right. Yeah, that person <laughs> is probably on disability right now. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I consider and talk about people on the dole, uh, and that was definitely one of them. Uh, I don't know sure how many kids that woman had, but it was a large number. 
and she was also trying to get every bit of government money she could get. The government cheese was floating down like a river of Gouda. Uh, man, I fielded a phone call in the control room of the prison where we all work together, including this person that we are speaking of. And their significant other called into the control room of the prison, collect <laughs> from, from York County Prison. Oh, my God. <laughs> that takes yeah. some, that takes some nuts, man. That takes some and real I'll nuts. Tell you what, I'll tell you what. That person was happy. They go, "Oh my gosh, I was hoping they would call while you were in the control room." And I was thinking in the back of my mind, I'm like, "Uh, man, you'd have been you'd have been better off if Raz answered the phone." Because <laughs> all I had was a whistle in my hand, and I blew it. Like keeping it, like come on, man. Like, oh, you don't think I'd have been blowing that whistle? Oh man. I had a family to feed. Like, I like this person. I really do. I really do. I got nothing against this person personally. I don't care about any choices or whatever, how they milk the system. It makes no difference to me. They're a good person. But I will tell you what. Not anything about this person would have made me risk my job. The second that happened, I told that person first. I was like, uh, you got this phone call from this place and... I'm not keeping this quiet. You need to get in front of this now. <laughs> like, somebody's going to hear about this. They should hear it from you and not from me. That's I'm not coming here to, to you know, get you to convince me to change my mind. No. Somebody's going to find out. Is it gonna be, is Some, someone's going to find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it going to be from you or is it going to be from me? Because, uh -uh. No, sir. No, 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 no. But either way, man. So, real important, and one, one, one sector of insurance that I know affects us both on, on a quite consistent and regular basis is medical insurance. It really does. And, you know, I've mentioned this before. I, I have, you know, you, you, you're disabled as a day is long. I also have a son that's uh, disabled. But let's just talk about... Uh, dealing with insurance companies because medical bills are there folks they're there in quite a, quite a, quite the quantity for both of us but yeah. my wife and I don't work at the same place i know shocking right so sure her insurance is through her employer my insurance is through my employer and whichever one is offering the best rates that year that's where our kids primary insurance is now you think okay that makes perfect sense no problem Except when those insurance companies are looking for any way, shape, or form to get out of paying the, any claim whatsoever. Oh, oh, yeah. So there is a form that every insurance company has, and it's the, same, the name is identical for every insurance company out there. And it is their, their, their biggest tool against fucking you over. Do you care the name of that form, Buck? No. Because I can't recall the name of that form off the top of my head, and I don't want to sound like an idiot. What is the name of the form, Raz? Coordination of Benefits. Oh, the C. Oh, yeah, the Coordination of Benefits. See, exactly. I'm glad that you said it, because I would have called it something completely different and just sounded tried to sound official. So, I worked for a healthcare system. I mean, we're, you know, we have quite the resumes. Maybe one episode, we just sit down and we go over our resumes together. Christ's sakes. But... I worked for a healthcare system, and of course, that's where our, my kid's insurance was. But why? Because it was a Cadillac, baby. It was Cadillac. However, every chance they got, and this was at least four times a year, they would send me a coordination of benefits form. Four freaking times a year, at least. Oh, yeah. And every time I put a, like a claim in for my, my, my youngest son, oh, we're going to need a coordination of benefits form. Dude, I have not worked there in a, quite a while now. I am across the damn country. I just got a bill in the mail from that healthcare entity, which was self-insured. That's why, that's why the health insurance was so great. From a visit that my son had in 2018, in the beginning of 2018... Where they just now decided to 
deny the claim and say, well, you didn't have a coordination of benefits on file at the time. There was one before that, and there was one after that. But there wasn't wow. one for that time period, even though they were always identical. So they're trying to get over $1,000 from me right now. Guess what they're going to get? They're getting, they're getting fuck all. That's what they're getting. You know, I, had to fill, I have to fill out coordination of benefits forms for Medicaid and Medicare. The money, like, is it not subsidized by the same government? And I know it's not. I, the money's coming from different places, but still. Like, that, the, not even that hand can wash the other one. I still, I still have to fill out COB forms. Dude, when, when my son first went on, uh, started getting a lot of medical care, we knew he qualified for disability, but we didn't actually do it right away. Eventually, we figured, okay, this is actually going to start adding up. So we went ahead and we filed for and uh, for disability through uh, Medicaid or Medicare. I'm not sure which one it is. And we were told we had to do it through our county office because that's the way it works in Pennsylvania. And we went there, and they started saying they would they needed all of our um, income information. I go, it doesn't have anything to do with our income. It's not based on income. He is a total life altering non-changing disability he's never getting better it's not non-changing it is a progressive disability correct i'm sorry you're right. cor- you are absolutely correct i just want to make sure because i got one of those two and i want i want that boy to be represented so they wanted my income fine whatever here's our tax returns piss off it has nothing to do with income i could be making a million dollars a year you still have to give it to him right but then they came back and they said well it says here you're a private investigator too I go, yeah, I do that part time. Well, we're gonna need your client list. You're gonna need to kiss my ass. <laughs> yeah, <that's> no. <laughs> so I, I swear to God, they got a list of all my clients redacted. I literally printed off my clients list off my uh, my my software, and I redacted everything, photocopied it, and sent it to them. I said, here you go. Here's a here's a paper full of black boxes. Suck my ass. Yeah, I mean, like seriously, that's a complete violation of your non disclosure agreements. I, I told him, it's like, listen, every one of these is an attorney. I'd be damned if I'm violating my NDA for your ass. And if you want to dispute that, you can just pick a name on this redacted list, and I'll say that's my attorney, and you can go talk to him. Well, you know, I'll, 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 go, I'll go to this. You know, one of the best ways to handle because when I got approved for disability insurance uh, through for, for my SSDI, from start to finish, because I had our friend help me when I still lived in Pennsylvania, but I dropped the ball on that, because I I made a decision that I didn't want to be disabled yet, and that I would work until I couldn't, and I did, but when I reached that point, and I finally pulled the trigger and said... No, no, you know, no, 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 I'm going to stop. You didn't pull the trigger on shit. You had to have a doctor put his boot in your ass. You're right. So when I had the doctor unload the gun... I uh, I I went on this. I I got the ball picked up again, and it only took me three weeks, which is bloody amazing. And I'll tell you, you know, I will give you this secret, and there, and it goes back to my experience with the insurance company because I'll tell you what they taught me how to do was use the phone. Nobody, nobody ever will be able to look at me and say that they can use a phone as good as me. I will not allow it because I am the very best. And when I called in and I spoke to these people, first step was this. They sent me a form in the mail and it had somebody's name on there. And once I had a name, there was blood in the water. That was it. I was like, all right, now I got a name. So then I called in and I finally got a hold of this person. And again, remember, you're on disability now. You've got nothing better to do in a day. So don't say, oh, well, it takes so much time. Bitch, you got nothing but time. Pick up the phone, okay? You pick up the phone, you call the person whose name is on your form, and you talk to them. And this is what I said. I said, hey, you know, this is me. My claim, this and this and this. It said you're my investigator or the adjudicator or whatever they were. And, you know, my medical history is pretty complicated. So if you need records from any of these places, you let me know. And I just want to do what I can to help and make this process go as quick as possible. 
the person gave me the whole song and dance. They were like, yeah, yeah, we'll let you know, we'll let you know. And they're trying to get me off the phone, which is completely understandable. Like, nobody wants to be hovered over when they do their job. But here's the thing. You call in, you offer to do nothing but help. Ask where they are in the process, see what hiccups they have, how you can be of any assistance, because that's all a smokescreen. Here's what you want to get to down to doing. You get them to make a commitment. Once you have a commitment, you now have a reason to call. So, what do I mean by a commitment? Oh, well, you know what, sir? You know, that sounds great. Thank you so much for all your assistance. I'm going to give you a call back in two days to see how everything's going. Fair enough? Of course they're going to agree because they want to get you off the phone, but they said yes. They said yes, it is fair enough. Well, guess what's going to happen in two or three days? Your phone's going to ring again, and I'm going to call you, and I want to know exactly where we are in the process. And you're going to tell me everything's going swimmingly. Great. I'm going to give you a call back in two or three days to see if there's anything else I can do. Boom. Two or three days go by. Pick up the phone. Call them back. You stay on top of these people, and all they're going to want to do is get rid of your ass. That's it. That's all they want to do. That's all they want to do. But they can't dismiss you because you're not being, for lack of a better term, you're not being dismissible. All you're doing is doing your best to help and assist in any way, shape, or form. You're not trying to give them any information. Oh, well, this and this and this. Let me explain. No. Well, here's the thing. Those people, they're dealing with the same thing I would deal with. They right. know nine out of every ten motherfuckers coming through that door is full of shit. Exactly. And that's why you call them up and you get a commitment. Because you know what? If you're telling the truth, your story is going to speak for itself. And if you're telling a lie, it's going to crumble and your house of cards will fall, and you will sit there and collect nothing. But the people that are righteously entitled to their disability, if they stay on top of it, and they just get all you need is a name, just get a little bit of blood in the water, and that's it. You get a name of a person that you can call on the phone, and you leave them messages, you leave them, you know, pleas of, you know, your undying assistance and support to their cause, you just want to make their job easier, but you call them until you speak with them and after you get them on the phone you get them to make a commitment you commit to them getting a follow up in two or three days and I swear to you you that person does not want to call if you leave enough voicemails and if you are enough of a presence in this person's life your claim will go to the top of their to do list because they want to get rid of your ass so make sure that you are persistent. Just don't be a pest. When you need something from an insurance company, you need a name, and you got to be persistent. Yes. Now, I'm going to talk about two things on that. First, I'm going to talk about the disability advocate, the disability key side of things. So whenever you see a, a billboard or an ad or commercial, anything of that nature for a disability advocate, what's the tagline they always say? We don't get paid unless you get paid. Well, that, and have you been denied... and you know, uh, benefits. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they're hooked, yeah. Have you been denied? It's traditional. Most people realize this. Everyone gets denied on their initial application. Unless you roll in there, you know, a head in a jar, you are most likely going to get denied on your initial application. So that's the big hook. They think, well, I got denied. I need an advocate now. And, and our friend who was an advocate, he was very good at what he did, but he's no longer in practice, so I can I have no qualm saying this. You don't need a disability advocate. You can do this on your own. You really can. As long as you're not uh, a fraudulent douche canoe, you can do this on your own. And you can do it by being persistent. Yep. Now, if you're if you're a, a lying scumbag, uh, give up now. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's plenty of lying scumbags that make it through the process, uh, but it's not it's not an easy journey. Uh, those people are paid to ferret out your lying ass. And a lot of them are very good at it. Uh, a lot of them eventually do get just burnt out and just deny everything blanketly, though. Uh, your your goal eventually is to get it before a, a judge. Right. Right. You got to get you got to go before the judge. That's in a lot of cases. That's because I did court interpreting for that. 
and uh, yeah, you got to get in front of a judge. So that's the big thing. Now, the other thing with insurance, <laughs> um, just don't ever give them a reason because they're looking for a reason. They tell you they need that stupid coordination of benefits form. Fill out that stupid coordination of benefits form. It's the dumbest thing in the world, but that's their hook. That's what they're going to hang their hat on when they're trying to deny a claim. They're going to say, you didn't do this. It, it's just, it's ridiculous. Uh, the same thing can be said with uh, in, in vehicles. If you're getting a car accident, you shut your damn mouth because that's what they're telling you to do. Don't even apologize. You know, when I get new employees in and I do safety orientation with them, I tell them straight up, you go to the person and you ask them if they're okay and if you want them to call an amb- if you want they would like you to call an ambulance that is the only interaction you have with them you say i will go wait in my car until the police get here and that's it you don't have any more interaction with them right so that, that those are my big insurance tips get before a judge you don't need an advocate fill out the damn paperwork and shut your mouth how yeah. about you what what's your big insurance tips um, mine would be to be persistent again. Um, make sure that you follow up on everything. You got follow up is the key with insurance, because like you said about that coordination of benefits form, and that's how they they hook you. They hook you because they get a reason to. If you follow up, you will get a reason to hang them up. You really will, you know. But yeah. even even the even the blind squirrel gets a nut. So you gotta be persistent. Another thing is. Look at the claims paying experience of the company that you are going to purchase from. Okay, and this applies across any insurance all across the board. Disability insurance, you know, Aflac, uh, which is a company name, it's really big around there, and, and they sell their own breed of insurance all the way up to life insurance if you're going to own, like, you know, one of the bigger companies in that sector. You know, you need to look at that company's ability to pay the claim because it really doesn't matter how many billboards you see them on, if they have problems getting money to the people that pay the premiums, they're not worth their salt at all. But um, but 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 when I went to the insurance fair, they gave me a plushie. Uh-huh. Yes, they did. <laughs> and you know what? Those things, I think, honestly, I think my, my oldest, my oldest child got one of those at like, um, at like some, you know, Pennsylvania street fair thing and then some insurance company was handing them out and you know what it was a great stuffed animal those those merchandisers the life insurance and medical insurance merchandisers that's why I stayed with those companies so long because those things are freaking neat okay all the stuff <laughs> no man no all the stuff they give you let me tell you what man I got water bottles I got freaking travel bags and they're, they're not chintzy either, man. They're not chintzy. They give you that stuff. But, you know, th- either way, you know, I'm getting off topic there because I really do. I love the trinkets. I just love the trinkets. But Bucking his freaking swag bag rolling through the insurance expo. Oh, you have no idea. Especially now that I got a wheelchair, man. I'll zip tie that thing right on here and bada bing. But, um, give me your chotskis, give me your water bottles, give me your tote bags. Oh, man, I got a cup holder on this thing. I bet you your water bottle would fit great in here. Let's give that a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my wife when she goes to conferences. She she literally takes an, an empty bag with her just for bringing all the swag back. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it's awesome, though. It's, it's cool stuff. But seriously, though, if you're shopping for insurance or, or dealing with an insurance company anyway, your follow-up is your key. Be persistent. Know the claims paying experience of the company that you are contracting with. Because, again, it doesn't matter how cheap the premium is. If they don't pay their people when there's an accident or, you know, you file a life insurance claim and they don't pay off the life insurance, it doesn't matter how low the premium is because you're not going to get shit anyhow. So you got to look at the claims paying experience of the company. And then also how their customer service department works. These are... At, and and that is probably one of the most underestimated parts of picking an insurance company. Can you get a person on the phone? If you have a problem, who do you call? And I'm gonna if, call. Pretty much, because <laughs> I'll tell you what: some insurance companies, the the roof blows off your house, you're calling house busters, and not in a good way, because they're the people who don't care if your house is busted. 
because you paid them premiums and they're going to do everything they can not to replace your roof. Act to God. That is the company you stay away from. Companies that you go and shop with are ones that have great reviews of people going, oh my gosh, you know, this and this and this happened. And all I did was call my insurance company and they paid. Well, you get enough of those people singing, singing praises about you. And guess what? Excitement breeds excitement. People are going to go where, where, where it's easiest. So look, look for those little nuggets of information and decide whether or not the, the ass pain of dealing with something is worth $10 a month more in premium or not. Yeah. Now, I, I, I want to give one last piece of advice when dealing with insurance, whether it's home, auto, disability, what have you. It doesn't matter. These guys are all stuck in the Stone Age. I'm going to tell you that right now. Every damn one of them is stuck in the Stone Age, especially the bigger the company it is. The bigger the company it is, the more likely they are to only communicate via snail mail. Ugh. They, are the, they, they will. That is the only damn way they'll communicate with you is through the mail. And they will send things out to you, important things, forms that need to be submitted or you're not going to get uh, your, your money. And it will look like junk mail. It really oh, will. Yeah. So if you get anything in the mail from your insurance company, or okay. any insurance company for that matter, open the damn thing and look at it. And if if it if it's like we we need this form from you, you fill it out, you put an extra stamp on it, and you send it back. But you got to make sure you're actually checking that stuff because they're they're looking for reasons to deny your claim, folks. They're not there to help you. They can say you know <laughs> we're, we're a good neighbor or <laughs> you know something of that nature, but reality is it's how do we deny this claim yeah yeah it is and it's really unfortunate because it, the, the business wasn't started with that in mind you know people people trying to work the system over is what made this industry what it is and, you know? and that is the violation of the social contract folks right there is people that we have something in place that is there to ensure that you are not left in a destitute state or in a way that you can't get help that you need that are exploiting the system and causing it. So we're almost back to, you know, it's better than us not to have the damn thing. That is about what it looks like to most people. So it really is. And it's a shame. You know, you may, you know, still abide by the, the, the old adage that snitches get stitches. But if you know somebody committing insurance fraud, report them. That's your that's your premiums, and that's your you know the next time you put in a claim getting denied, it's on you. Right. The the only person that suffers in the long run is me. You know, pretty much. <laughs> no, that you know what I mean. That's why it took me so long to finish that because you know what that analogy really doesn't apply. You know. Because in in that instance with insurance fraud, the only sufferer is everyone else. It really is. So that being said, I think we're going to leave it leave it there and, and our distaste for insurance salesmen and people that work in the insurance industry uh, and, and Buck. and <laughs> But he's not there anymore, hey, so we, we can like him again. But that being said... I love uh, look forward to us each and every week. Uh, we, we're getting out there. We're getting out there. We're we're on most social media. I'm sorry, yeah, social media. We're on most podcast platforms now. Haven't quite hit iTunes just yet. That's still in the approval process because Apple takes forever. But you can find us on Overcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, Anchor, YouTube, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Breaker, Castbox, and any other number of places that happen to pick up our RSS feed. Uh, but if you want to get on our YouTube, for example, and leave a comment, uh, if you want to rate us on any of the other podcast platforms, give us a five star rating. We'd appreciate that a lot. And we're looking for new ideas for episodes. Uh, you can drop us an email at socialliability at iCloud.com. And we will be back hopefully next week with a brand new episode that we haven't picked a topic yet on, but I'm sure it's something that we can complain about for at least an hour. Oh, yeah. Easy. <laughs> that being said, folks, I'm Raz. This is Buck, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.